Hey everyone, welcome back. And uh, today we have a real special guest, Dr. Nadir Ali is here. And he is a keto-friendly cardiologist from Houston, Texas. So welcome. Welcome to uh, uh, this channel. Can you hear me? I, I can hear you well, uh, Eric. Okay, great, thank I, you. I, I am, I'm honored to be here on this channel. And uh, I am honored to uh, be a part of your program. And as I told you, I have had a long held admiration for you. Uh, many of my patients are avid fans of yours and your Friday uh, uh, podcast. So they look forward to it. They come and give me all kinds of feedback. I have learned how to communicate with my patients based on what you do oh, to wow. some degree. Wow. Wow, thank you. That's awesome. Um, well, I'm really a pleasure to meet, meet you in person. Actually, sort of through the uh, internet, line, internet lines here. Um, you know, um, just for everyone's knowledge, you're going to be one of the main speakers at our next Keto Summit coming up in August, at the end of August, August 31st and September 1st. It's, uh, I think it's Labor Day weekend. And... Uh, uh, we're going to have a blast. So I'm really excited to have you come out and speak. You know, you, you bring to the table something very unique. I mean, you know, one of the big things right now, hot topics, is this cholesterol thing and the LDL and people are concerned. And you see these things in the, uh, in the news where, oh, don't do keto. It's going to raise your cholesterol and you're going to die of a heart attack. Yeah. I, yeah. <laughs> and so um, coming just from your field, I mean, I guess that's what, what you're taught, right? In school, like, I guess the, the whole cholesterol dogma has just been pushed so much. It's so ingrained in us that it's, uh, sometimes it's hard to look at the actual data. Um, what's, your, what's your thought on that? Uh, that's like delving right into it, and I'm glad you're doing it that way because we don't waste time in <laughs> unnecessary stuff. Exactly. Uh, but I've been practicing for almost 30 years and uh, as a cardiologist. And the dogma that has been taught to us is that low cholesterol, low LDL is one of the best things for you to do. And unfortunately, if you compile all information about optimal human nutrition, about human brain size, about what we need to eat and how we need to behave to reduce our LDL cholesterol, inevitably it's going to lead to very poor health. It's gonna to lead to obesity, uh, insulin resistance, diabetes, hypertension, all the chronic diseases that are going to reduce your quality of life, that's gonna make you die earlier and so I was kind of surprised that there's such a huge paradox between LDL cholesterol and every other biomarker of health. You can take anyone, you know, they go in opposite direction. If you want to improve your insulin resistance, your LDL is going to go up. If you want to reduce your weight, your LDL is going to go up. Mm, interesting, interesting. So I started thinking about this as a paradox, but then when you put everything together, you understand that that's how our body is probably designed to behave. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I uh, go out there now for the last five years. It, took me time to understand why LDL goes up on a low carb diet. And it took me time to understand that that is not necessarily bad. And in some ways, having high LDL cholesterol with very good other biomarkers might be something to celebrate, not mourn. Mm. And uh, I could elaborate on some of that. Um, but I wanted more interaction. I wanted you to kind of chime in and say, hey, I want to lead this podcast in this direction. Yeah, exactly. Because I wanted to, there's some, there's some things that I'm interested in personally that I, I would like to know your viewpoint on. Um, 
you know, cholesterol, LDL is, is called bad cholesterol, but really it's a, it's a cargo ship. It's a transport ship and it delivers cholesterol. We need cholesterol. I'm hoping that most people know that our body makes cholesterol. Um, but what I'm interested to just start off with talking about is your take on LDL actually carries, I think all of the fat soluble vitamins vitamin A, D, E, K, K1, and K2. Um, have you seen any data on that? Um, um, especially even vitamin E too, as an antioxidant. Uh, I, I think it does. The data on this is kind of not, uh, at least I'm not aware of some very good data on that. Okay. I know that vitamin D does have its own carrier protein and that maybe the LDL is a secondary mechanism uh, for carrying uh, vitamin D around. Uh, but I guess one of the other major functions of LDL would be to carry CoQ10 uh, because I'm not sure all the muscle cells are capable of making the CoQ10 that they need for mitochondrial function. And, um, uh, but you're right. Uh, LDL is a carrier molecule, not just for triglycerides and cholesterol per se, uh, but for many antioxidants, uh, fat-soluble vitamins, CoQ10. Yeah. And I do know that um, you have all these phospholipids as, as well that are, uh, I think it's, uh, that make up the cell wall. And um, so we have a transport system of cholesterol. Uh, cholesterol doesn't just float around by itself. It needs to be transported. Um, and I think that uh, um, if you could just touch a little bit on the, the necessary function of LDL, um, that's one area I wanted to, I want to touch on. And then also I want you to maybe mention a little bit about statins and what the problem with statins that you run into. I'm sure that, you know, that's a t hot topic with, in your field. I mean, I'm, a lot of cardiologists prescribe them. Right. So let's first talk about cholesterol in general and then move on to LDL cholesterol in particular. Um, cholesterol in general is an extremely important molecule for life. There is no life on earth without cholesterol. Every living cell has cholesterol. If you go back to some of the earliest parts of evolution when we started out as single cell beings in this world, those single cells also had cholesterol. Really? Wow, I so didn't know that. If you look at cholesterol, it is an integral part of every cell membrane. The cell membrane gets its structural integrity, the fluidity, so that it acts as a barrier because cholesterol is connecting the phospholipids in such a way that it is providing those functions. Mm. Um, the second major way to think about cholesterol is to look at brain function. Because in our brain, there are these cholesterol rafts, and these rafts are uh, locations where neurotransmitters sit. So the structural integrity of the neurotransmitter receptors is because of these cholesterol rafts. And if you deprive the brain of cholesterol, the integrity of these neurotransmitter receptors is affected. So there is a lot of data that comes out and says that there are certain statins that cross the blood-brain barrier can have significant cognitive dysfunction. Yeah. And in fact, cholesterol is so important for the brain that it does not delegate the responsibility to any other organ to make cholesterol. It makes its own. Wow. And I often joke that I would not be able to deal with the stress of being a cardiologist or giving this podcast if it were not for cholesterol because the LDL molecule is supplying cholesterol as raw material to my adrenal gland so that it can make the stress hormone, which is called cortisol. Mm -hmm. and, and that's an absolutely amazing fact that many of the hormones, the backbone of that is a cholesterol molecule. And the 
carrier molecule that is supplying that cholesterol to make that is the LDL. And I often joke to audiences saying that, hey, men look handsome because of LDL cholesterol. <laughs> I like that. And the reason is, is because the LDL is the one that is supplying testis with cholesterol, the raw material to make testosterone. And similarly, women look beautiful because their ovaries also need cholesterol to convert cholesterol to estrogens. So um, these are functions that are sometimes completely skimmed over when we try to knock the LDL down like crazy and say, hey, we, the lowest is better. And it made no sense to me as a cardiologist because I've been practicing for 30 years. And I have seen people come in having extensive three vessel heart disease with blockages everywhere with cholesterol levels as low as 50. Wow, wow. And I have seen 90 year old women or older with LDL cholesterols in the mid 200s who I take them to the cardiac cath lab and I find that they have the most beautiful blood vessels that uh, you and I although maybe several decades younger, would be happy to trade those blood vessels with them. Wow. Wow. That's, that's fascinating. <laughs> so I've been a bit of a skeptic all my life about this cholesterol being a causal factor in coronary artery disease because it made no sense. Mm -hmm. And if you really take the trouble to talk to patients you would find that they complain of all kinds of side effects on cholesterol reducing medicines. Mm -hmm. It's just that the medical profession has moved in such a direction that we rely so much on information coming in from societies that we have given up our clinical acumen. We have given up our critical thinking ability. We want to just follow guidelines. Mm -hmm. We don't want to do our own work. We don't want to listen to patients. Right. We don't want to be skeptics. As a physician, I think it's highly necessary for us to be quite skeptical about every information and use our clinical intuition when we are taking care of patients. Exactly. Um, I also was fascinated that the LDL cholesterol is so involved in host defense. Mm -hmm. and, and this is not something many people talk about because host defense, that means how we protect against bacteria and viruses, is in some ways mediated by the LDL cholesterol. I have put out some elegant information from different studies that I have looked at in which like, for example, there is this fascinating paper which looked at a mouse lung and they infected the mouse lung with bacteria. And these bacteria, they elaborate a little protein that goes in as a pilot to investigate and see if the milieu is suitable to establish an infection. So the bacteria themselves are smart. They won't go in and start an infection without checking the area out first. <laughs> And that marker protein comes back and gives uh, uh, an information to the bacteria. It's called quorum sensing protein. And it comes back and says, hey, let's establish infection. And I was surprised to find that in this paper, there's elegant work that shows that it is the LDL cholesterol that is going in there and neutralizing this protein so that bacterial infection cannot gain a foothold. Wow. Fascinating, fascinating. I definitely want to get a copy of that. Um, so, um, it, yes, it actually has ability to attack pathogens. It also has the ability to bring antioxidants into a certain area and dump uh, vitamin E into uh, an epithelial wall to help protect against lesions. I mean, wow. um, now, most of the time, from my viewpoint, it, it seems like people go on a keto program and it lowers the LDL, but then you have people that have a higher LDL. Um, let's just talk about 
what would be some of the reasons why um, someone would actually cut the carbs down and their LDL would go up? Any reason for that? Yeah, that's one of my strengths. I think that I'd like to take a little credit that I'm the first one to point out in a national audience mm. uh, as to the molecular mechanisms why LDL is going up. And, and I'm so glad that you brought that up uh, because this is something that has bothered me a lot. You know, as a cardiologist for the last five years, uh, I have been practicing uh, a low carb diet myself and recommending it to a lot of patients. And I have been seeing that as many, you know, in a large majority of these patients, as they lose weight, as their diabetes improves, as they come off diabetic medications, as their triglyceride levels go down, as their HDL level goes up, the one troubling finding that was happening is that the LDL goes up. And it goes up, unlike what people think, it goes up almost in everyone. It may go up to a variable degree, but it goes up in everyone. So I wanted to explain why that is happening. And in the final analysis, I think this is, and although this is my model and it's not been proven in studies yet, but I think that's what we should do, is that when you are going on a low carb diet, by design, you're burning fat. Um, we have very limited carbohydrate reserves. We run out of them in a situation in which we stop eating like intermittent fasting or going on a fast for several days. You're gonna run out of carbohydrate reserves in about six to eight hours. And then your body predominantly becomes fat burning. So it's burning triglycerides, and it's, there are certain tissues that cannot directly burn triglycerides. So what it does is that the liver takes the triglycerides and converts them to ketones. So the liver is the only organ that has the enzymatic machinery to make ketones. So it's taking the triglycerides, it converts the triglycerides to acetyl-CoA, which then enters the mitochondria. And then the acetyl-CoA through a series of enzymatic reaction gets converted to HMG-CoA. Now HMG-CoA fascinatingly is a branch point. It's the same raw material that cholesterol uses to make cholesterol in the body. That means HMG-CoA can go on and make cholesterol and HMG-CoA can also get converted to ketones. That's right, interesting. So if by design you are doing better oxidation of fat, it just means that you're burning fat. If you're burning fat, you are making a lot of ketones. And if you're making a lot of ketones, by design, you're going to make a lot of cholesterol in the liver. And I'm not just basing this on hypothesis. There are a lot of animal studies that are human studies that give you indirect evidence that this is what is happening. And if you think it's right, I want to take you through a, a few of these. Yeah, yeah, I think, uh, it, you know, it's, it's, it makes to total sense because yeah, it could go split off this way and make uh, ketones or cholesterol. So I, I do remember that chemistry. So I'm like, wow, I never actually considered that viewpoint, but that, that makes a lot of sense. And I think the, 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 this, in this day and age, the reason it's important to collaborate is because a biochemist is not going to completely look at that point and say, hey, I want to think about it that way. Right. And neither is a nutritionist and nor is a cardiologist alone because they don't understand the details of the biochemical steps in the liver. But when you put all of these people together in a podcast like yours or at a low carb conference, it starts gelling this information. And that's how we would make advance by collaborating. Right. So I, to, go, to go back into this uh, information. So there, is, there are these uh, drugs which are being used for diabetes, which are called SGLT2 inhibitors. Um, Invocana is one of them, Giardians is one of them. 
And basically what these drugs do is that our body filters sugar in the kidneys, but it reabsorbs most of the sugar. But these drugs poison the kidney tubules in such a way that you don't reabsorb the sugar that you're filtering. So basically you're dumping sugar. So when you're dumping sugar, and if you're not eating carbs, or if you're, let's say, fasting, the body switches to fat metabolism. Because you don't have sugar available, you're going to do now fat burning. Mm -hmm. So when they started using this in humans, they started noticing that ketone levels go up. They also started noticing that LDL cholesterol levels go up. Hmm. And fascinatingly, in some of these studies, now that since there is no conflict here, uh, in, in the sense that the pharmaceutical companies, and I'm sorry for being a skeptic, but the pharmaceutical companies want to show that, hey, dumping sugar and reducing your blood sugar is beneficial for you. And by the way, it'll be helpful for you to prevent heart disease. And that's what they found. But they could not explain, hey, you're improving heart disease, but your LDL levels are going up. Uh, and so there's an accompanying paper that's done in a, in a hamster, which goes into the biochemical mechanisms with this. Uh, so what's happening is that as you are dumping sugar, you are more, making more ketones, and as you're making more ketones, the liver is synthesizing more cholesterol. And since the liver has a higher amount of cholesterol, it doesn't need cholesterol for itself. Otherwise, what the liver does is that, hey, cholesterol is so important for me, let me soak up some cholesterol from circulation. And it has these LDL receptors. These receptors are there that soak up the cholesterol from the circulation and remove it for liver to be able to use it. But since LDL, since liver is synthesizing so much cholesterol, it doesn't need that cholesterol from circulation. So it down-regulates the LDL receptors. Mm. And also, since it's making so much cholesterol and since cholesterol is not a metabolic fuel, in other words, we can't burn cholesterol like we can burn sugar, and triglycerides, the only way for us to eliminate it is in bile. Wow. Fascinating. And this paper shows that your cholesterol elimination in bile goes up. So you can see that the feces are now filled with cholesterol. Wow. Wow. And another fascinating mechanism that, that they talked about is that the LDL cholesterol is in some way an antioxidant. It, it, uh -huh. it is fighting antioxidant injury and it gets oxidized in the process. When it gets oxidized in the process, it gets picked up by the macrophages through a certain receptor. So the macrophages go around and say, hey, this LDL has done its job. Let me just pick it out from circulation. And this paper shows that these macrophages that are laden with oxidized LDL cholesterol their elimination through the gut, through feces, is promoted in the setting of fat oxidation. Hmm. So here is a complete picture. You're burning fat, you're making more ketones, you're making more cholesterol in the liver, and hence you're gonna make more LDL because the uh, liver has to mobilize that cholesterol it's gonna downregulate the LDL receptors because it doesn't need cholesterol anymore. It's gonna upregulate cholesterol elimination. So your bile acid production goes up, the elimination of bile goes up, and it also improves the elimination of oxidized cholesterol. Fascinating. So, so um a couple things. If you're getting an increased bile production, you could also have, it could be, create a laxative effect. You could have a little diarrhea, maybe some of the side effects. But the question I have is that, um, so people are, are probably understanding this now, but they're thinking, is this extra cholesterol going to stick in my arteries and clog up an artery? 
that's I think that's the big question that they are concerned about. So I think that one thing I would like to humbly submit is that we don't understand the molecular mechanisms why we get plaque in our blood vessels. And I almost hesitate to call it an atherosclerotic plaque because that gives it a connotation that somehow cholesterol is the culprit. So right. I want to stay and say, hey, it, it is plaque formation. And to say that the LDL is the primary culprit that gets onto the vascular wall, onto the uh, subendothelium, and, and I want to be cognizant of, by, by not using too many medical terms, that is the layer just beneath the lining of a blood vessel, and then initiate a response in which you are making plaque is by no means scientifically agreed that that are the mechanisms. Mm -hmm. It is quite equally possible that the LDL cholesterol is there to help repair an injury that happened as a result of oxidative stress, which means that whenever you burn something, you create an injury. And oxygen, when it is used in a certain way, creates an injury at the level of the vessel. And that could be from high blood pressure, that could be from a result of an infection, that could be because you are insulin resistant. And as a result of that, you have systemic inflammation that is leading to vascular injury. And is this vascular injury being promoted by the LDL or is the LDL just there to help prevent oxidative damage. And in the process, you see it around, and that does not mean that it is the culprit. And one of the many people from whom I have borrowed this line is that if you go to a scene of a fire, you're going to see firefighters. But you're never going to blame the firefighters for causing the fire. Right, right. And, and so is the case with the LDL. I'm not sure it is there to cause, I don't know if it's the culprit. I don't know if it is there to help. Right. And the paradox is that you see vascular damage in people with very low LDLs, and you see no vascular damage in people with LDLs in the mid 200s. And it simply does not jive that it is a graded culprit. Mm. If it is a graded culprit, you should see consistency of effect. Right. And if it's a graded culprit, you should see that, hey, if I reduce my cholesterol, LDL cholesterol down to 30 milligrams per deciliter, since this is my primary hypothesis that this is what is causing vascular injury, I should see no vascular injury. And I can take you through many papers in which they have dropped the LDL down to 30 milligrams and have changed the event rate either by less than half a percent or have done it in the opposite direction. <laughs> so wow. to me, that makes no sense. And right. this is the kind of critical thinking that I want physicians who are taking care of patients to do mm -hmm. is that you cannot rely on relative risk reduction that many of the papers talk about. You want to look at absolute risk reduction. You want to look at the integrity of data. You need to be a skeptic and see who is doing the studies and what is their bias behind that. Right. Right. Yeah, they just, I think they, in 2005, they came out with a rule, I'm not sure how well drug companies follow it, that they have to be more transparent, upload all the research on a given drug. I, I don't know if they're following that, um, but before 2005, they, you could selectively publish what you wanted to publish, unfortunately. So if, you're, if you as a doctor are researching and you're only getting half the picture, you're just you're gonna see something that's not, not the true data. Um, one thing I was gonna ask you, um, being a cardiologist, what, 
when you're looking into an artery, looking at plaque, do you find a certain pattern of where that plaque is located? Is it always in the carotid arteries? Is it in another artery? Uh, does it happen in certain high pressure areas or is it just random? Well, uh, to a large degree, it does happen where there are, where there is shear stress. Mm -hmm. So, you know, shear could be a medical term. So basically at a branch point, the blood flow is not laminar. The, you know, laminar is smooth blood flow. Turbulence is when the blood flow is not smooth. And at areas of branch point, there is possibility of turbulence. And at this point, there is a lot of stress on the vessel wall. And that can happen as a result of high blood pressure. That can happen as a result of the blood vessels getting constricted, which means getting smaller. So you predominantly see plaque buildup in those locations. But it can also be found at other places that are more or less random that you would say, hey, this is a process that you can predict to some degree that it will happen at branch points and at places of high shear stress, but it can also happen in other locations. So like, for example, you mentioned the carotid arteries. The carotid arteries bifurcate, uh, when I say bifurcate, they divide into two blood vessels right here in the neck. Uh, and at this point, one blood vessel is going and supplying the brain. The other blood vessel is supplying the face. And at that branch point, there is more likelihood of you getting buildup of plaque and buildup of uh, uh, blockages. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm trying to stay away from saying buildup of an atherosclerotic plaque. Right. Because exactly. that implies a certain causation. And, right. uh, and then you, you, what about the, uh, the coronary arteries? Uh, is, that, is that more common than the carotids? So uh, both occur concomitantly. Like if you have coronary artery disease, the likelihood that you can have carotid artery disease is about 50%. Okay. And if you have carotid artery disease, the likelihood of you having coronary artery disease goes up dramatically. And what goes up even higher, a, a, a more a further end stage, that means a more advanced stage of vascular disease would be blockages in the blood vessels of the leg. So if you have blockages in the blood vessels of the leg, the possibility that you have heart disease, which means blockages, carotid disease, the blood supply to the brain, and kidney disease is very high. So wow. unfortunately, people with uh, blockages in their blood vessels, that demonstrates that there is a more advanced uh, vascular disease present in them, and hence you would find it in other locations as well. Interesting. The patients that come see you, um, are they coming um, f with blood pressure or um, are they coming because they already been diagnosed and they need surgery? What type of clients come to see you? So in the first uh, 24 years of my practice, I uh, predominantly tried to work in the cardiac cath lab. So I would see patients referred to me with blockages in the blood vessels of the heart and I would take them to the cath lab and put stents in them and fix them. And these people do have high blood pressure. Many of them are diabetic. Uh, many of them have, um, uh, I would say, you know, and, I, and I hate to use the term high cholesterol, I would say poor quality cholesterol. Right. So I've, I've started using that term. And poor quality cholesterol, in my view, is somebody who's got high triglycerides and low HDL, and if you divide or if you evaluate their LDL cholesterol properly, it is the small dense molecule and not, not the large and fluffy molecule. So they had a number of these factors and I would open them up in the, in the cardiac cath lab. But in the last five years, I've gone through a transformation and I said, hey, if this nutrition works in me, I should try it in my patients. And so now I spend more and more time, at least 50% of my time or more in the office. And I am surprised that 
I, on a weekly basis, get calls from people in New York, California, Arizona, New Mexico, and Louisiana saying that, hey, we want to come see you. Wow. Uh, for, for nutritional advice, for wow. questions that they have about the LDL. And, and, I, and I tell them that, look, it's, I feel uncomfortable that you need to travel all the way to come see me. Uh, I'm sure that you will find a low-carb practitioner nearby who can give you all the information that you need because it's too much for somebody to travel, take an airplane just to come see a physician for a, a, you know, a short office visit. So now I'm beginning to see more and more people who are coming purely for nutritional advice. And I uh, say, okay, yeah, I, I would do that, but you would be surprised that when you're giving nutritional advice, you uncover that their poor nutrition has contributed to insulin resistance, high blood pressure, diabetes, obesity, in so many different ways. Mm -hmm. And I am surprised that the impact of nutrition and lifestyle is so much greater than medications. Wow. It's, it's, it's an order of magnitude greater than medications without the side effects. And I'm not sure why people are not working at that. And, 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 and that's why my opening slide at Low Carb Denver said, I am concerned that the medical profession is going to get buggy whipped. <laughs> that's funny. Because they are not listening to the grassroots movements that says, hey, I am doing all these things and I'm improving why as a medical professional are you not looking into this right right i know it's it's starting to it's like a it's like a wildfire fly fire just spreading all over the place so yes i mean if you if you don't um after all it comes down to the patient and the patient does want this shift is they want alternatives they don't necessarily like the drugs they want to get off the drugs so they're looking for doctors like you and um, that can actually uh, give them good good information um, so yeah things are really really changing that's so you you basically um, you, you must have a lot of uh, uh, actually probably very enjoyable to take someone where you can see it's pretty obvious and then completely shift them but by changing their diet it's just it's, it's such a big effect that you can create um, that probably before I know in my practice even before I knew about some of this stuff you know I'd be treating these specific symptoms with all these different pills people would go home with a uh, hundred pills and all these vitamins and stuff but I didn't work on the basics I didn't get the eating corrected until I started doing that like the need for all these other things go way down so it's just remarkable um, so I'm so happy that I had a chance to talk to you I, um, and get this great data. And I'm excited to have you come out. Um, so those of you that are watching, um, you should come out and definitely come to our event. It's going to be at the end. I'll put a link down below. And I also want to put a link to your um, YouTube channel so people can start watching your videos. I think you're starting to release more videos. From yes, uh, yes, that's true. They, they come either under my name, which is Nadir Ali MD. Uh, and they also come under Eat Mostly Fats Nutrition. Oh, right. And some of them are being rele released by Keto Fest and uh, Low Carb Down Under. But if I may, I want to entice your audience, uh, and not that uh, your, your uh, conference is not going to be completely sold out. I heard that last year you did, did it on very short notice. And even though you did it on short notice, there were no seats that were unfilled and people were waiting in line. But I wanted to still entice them to come because the talk that I'm working on right now and which is very fascinating is to answer the question as to what is optimal human nutrition. Mm. And the way I want to approach that area is by looking at these concepts, and I'll just leave you with the concepts. I'll not define them in any particular way. One of them would be what is called the expensive tissue hypothesis. What that simply means is that 
we have such an enormous energy expensive brain that is three times the size that you would predict based on our body size or any primate ancestor. It's 2% of our body mass and it consumes 20% energy. So feeding that brain is very important. The second aspect of that would be that how our digestive system has modulated and evolved over these periods. What is the diet that is suitable for us? Mm. The third thing would be what is our pancreas doing? Our pancreas kind of evolved without the stresses that the modern diet is putting on it. And it's not capable of handling glycemic load that we are giving to it in this day and age with the diet that we eat. And then finally, I want to look at the microbiome. You know, we have a gut that has bacteria in it. And how important is the microbiome? How important is, is fermentation? And there are many other concepts that are going to come in play to evaluate the most optimal human nutrition. Wow. You guys, you have to come to learn about this. This is going to be exciting. I can't wait to hear you. <laughs> it's going to be good. Well, thank you. I, I, I hope I deliver on my promise. I think you will. You're, you're a great presenter and uh, you've filled with gold. It's great, great, great data. So thank you so much. And uh, I'm looking forward to talking more with you uh, in a couple of months. I absolutely enjoyed being on your podcast, Eric, and I'm honored that I'll be a part of your conference. Awesome. Thank you.